Uh, today, uh, we will hear from John uh, Planty. John is a graduate student uh, at George Mason University in his third uh, year. Uh, he already has a number of very intriguing uh, working papers uh, to his name. Um, today, he will uh, uh, present about the budgetary rules and why the rules and the practice uh, are so, uh, so different. Um, but for this group, I think one of his papers that might be quite relevant is the one on ethics um, that he presented uh, in 2020, I believe, at, at public choice meetings. Um, so the, the title of the paper is uh, Ethics um, as a Topic of Economic Inquiry. Uh, and the interesting aspect of the paper is that it uh, treats ethics not from the normative standpoint, but it tries to explain sort of its emergent features and uh, how it results from um, humane interactions. So uh, just something uh, to, to look into uh, as you learn more about our uh, presenter. Um, but with that, uh, I would like to basically invite John. You, John disappeared from my screen. It's funny how things shift in uh, Zoom. But uh, in any case, uh, John, I think we, we are ready uh, for you. You should be able to, to share your screen if you like and take it from here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michaela. Just give me one minute, please, everyone. I'm going to try to figure out how to do this because me and computers are not really good together. Okay, here we go. We got it. perfect. It's right. Awesome. Now. And just a quick reminder with the time limit, try to keep it under mm -hmm. half an hour. We usually aim for 20 minutes, but if you can do it, in half an hour, then we can have uh, plenty of time for, for discussion. So, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Michaela. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Michaela said, my name is John Plant. I'm a third year economics PhD student at George Mason. I'm presenting this paper of a pretty long title, which I'll be uh, changing uh, most likely. Um, it's uh, currently titled at the the insidious effects of the Harvey Road uh, propositions, the, the rent creating and extracting state in the post Keynesian uh, fiscal commons. Um, I've been given feedback that's a bit uh, ideologically charged, which is definitely the case. And also, um, I've been given feedback that it's not exactly what, um, what Buchanan and Wagner had called the Harvey Road uh, pre the presuppositions when they had first uh, written their book, but that's besides the point. But anyway, uh, to kind of give you uh, some motivation uh, for uh, my paper before I really get into everything that I uh, have, uh, you might have noticed this paper is a bit different than what was on uh, the EPERN uh, uh, website before. Um, and that was because I had started off with a paper that uh, was probably trying to do way too much, uh, because that's kind of what happens when you first start doing these things. You uh, start off really trying to do uh, everything that is coming to your mind in one paper. Um, so now I've uh, put in this into, right now, uh, it's at about four different papers, and uh, this here is one of them, and this is going to be the uh, second um, uh, main chapter of my dissertation. I'm uh, looking to do uh, hopefully a total of uh, six papers for that, and uh, hopefully going to be using that as a foundation for a book. Uh, we shall uh, see uh, over time um, if that. Oh, I'm I'm so sorry, uh, Marta. I have no idea why I called you Michaela uh, twice there. No, um, no, no. Uh, yes, um, but uh, as of now, the uh, the title of the uh, dissertation is. Uh, the civilizing process of uh, public debt. And uh, the whole uh, impetus behind that, I think will become a bit more relevant as I uh, go through the whole presentation. Um, but again, uh, for motivation uh, behind this whole project, I'm trying to differentiate um, a lot of the work that is currently in the public debt literature. So uh, right now, what's uh, pretty hefty in the public debt literature, like. Uh, like even uh, more so within the past uh, three or four uh, years uh, has been looking at uh, whether public debt is uh, 
from a uh, macroeconomic point of view, uh, sustainable. So it's looking at both the uh, nominal interest rate, or what has just been uh, been more abbreviated as R, and the the uh, GDP gr uh, growth rate, which has been uh, abbreviated as G, and it's looking at the differential to see uh, what is greater than the other. And because we have an interest rate that is less than the growth rate, we have enough uh, money potentially, like according to these macroeconomists, uh, to be able to pay off um, and service our debt uh, over time. Uh, most notably in this literature is, uh, is Olivier uh, Blanchard. Uh, he has a paper um, on this that kind of goes through uh, some of the, the uh, welfare effects of that as well. And there's some other ones that I have uh, mentioned uh, here as well that look at to see if there is this uh, optimal point where we have uh, what has been called this uh, fiscal uh, free lunch. So if we can use fiscal policy to uh, kind of stimulate aggregate uh, demand without any cost. Um, so this is really what's out there now. And that's been a pretty uh, big thing in the literature. Um, I wanna kind of go against that uh, because um, I've been heavily influenced by Dr. Wagner who is uh, here in attendance uh, today. Um, and uh, looking only at the uh, macro level, we often uh, miss how we have these processes that actually uh, cause those macro phenomena uh, th uh, through interaction uh, at the uh, micro level and also uh, through change uh, over time from a more systems uh, point of view. So instead of kind of uh, looking at these macro phenomena, I want to bring the whole discussion back as Professor Rackner does to uh, political economy, uh, more specifically uh, looking at um, how public debt can have um, some kind of, as I title my dissertation, a civilizing process and how it will change how people act uh, towards each other um, or how we see this erosion of our constitution uh, over time. Uh, because of this uh, macro phenomenon of uh, public debt. So I know I've kind of given you like a lot of motivation so far. Um, I want to just uh, briefly give you some information on the other papers that I have uh, working so you can kind of see the big picture since I did um, all of that. Um, so like again, like I want to follow what Buchanan and Wagner had done in uh, 1977 in their book, uh, Democracy and Deficit, uh, but then go a bit uh, further and look at how public debt uh, creates incentives for interest groups to form. Then this paper here today is looking at how uh, public debt uh, creates incentives for there to be uh, political exchanges with uh, certain uh, interest groups. Uh, so there's gonna be some that are going to be uh, given privileges at the expense of others. And that's what we're, we, that we're gonna be talking about today. And then uh, because of that, we have these power um, and uh, wealth uh, dispersions uh, because of these, uh, these uh, kind of uh, triadic exchanges that we have uh, going on over time. And then finally that can kind of change our uh, sentiments uh, towards each other um, and I'll, I'd be happy to answer any questions about all those papers at a different uh, point, or maybe you'll see them in the future, um, either here or somewhere else. But now to get uh, specific with this paper that I have here, um, as you had uh, uh, seen in the paper, I currently have a pretty, um, I guess unorthodox kind of uh, setup. So I first start with my introduction and then I kind of have what uh, like it can kind of appear to be a historical narrative. Um, and that comes uh, prior to my theory. And that was actually done purposely because what I, I had wanted to do was after reading some uh, books that I have listed up here in my first uh, bullet point, um, I was kind of confused uh, like looking at all these uh, budgetary rules and then seeing that we aren't following them like we have them uh, on the books but 
in action. They're not being obeyed and, and they're actually kind of being purposely ignored. So I was uh, kind of curious and wanted to understand uh, why that was happening uh, from a more uh, economic uh, point of view, or I guess uh, uh, more like how are the incentives being um, shaped uh, to really allow for that. Uh, so I had obviously uh, built off some of the work from Professor Wagner that discusses some of this. Um, I also had looked at the paper uh, or, or a uh, chapter uh, by uh, Dave uh, Hebert on this topic as well, as, as well as an older paper by uh, Charles Riley, uh, Bob Tullison, and uh, Bill Shugart, uh, for those of you who read the paper that's in there as well. And their uh, main point is that uh, political competition is the reason why we see a lot of deficits and then these 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 uh, these lasting uh, public debts that are happening over time because we're all kind of uh, doing all of this uh, lobbying and uh, competing for a piece of the uh, the uh, budgetary pie over time, which then can kind of uh, cause a bunch of uh, haywire. Um, I definitely uh, do agree with this point, but again, uh, being influenced by Professor Wagner, I wanted to kind of, um, I guess, tie everything uh, together uh, using his uh, bi-directional uh, framework. Um, so from going from the uh, micro actions to the uh, macro phenomena, but also we have uh, macro foundations for uh, micro actions as well. So, so seeing, uh, public debt as this uh, macro phenomenon, uh, we can see how uh, that can change people's uh, expectations or their uh, moral imaginations uh, over time to then uh, want to uh, do uh, different things uh, in the future. So uh, as you have all read my paper, you'll uh, kind of notice that I talk about how uh, public debt uh, is a form of a a uh, non-compensated transfer, and that will entice uh, different uh, political actors and, and interest groups to engage in exchanges, but also uh, give them expectations that they'll be able to get uh, rents uh, going forward in the future. So that's uh, kind of how I'm trying to frame this whole, whole uh, puzzle uh, over time here. So I already kind of gave you my uh, thesis uh, briefly. I've learned from uh, Pete Becky, it's good to have like a really quick uh, elevator uh, speech for your uh, thesis. So I have it really briefly up here, but extensively uh, as you all have read the paper again, really what I'm trying to argue is that uh, public debt is not just uh, a form of rent, but it's also a uh, non-compensated transfer. And I kind of give like the reasoning of how these things are very much related, but uh, a little bit more nuanced um, in the uh, paper. Um, but the whole uh, point, uh, despite all this uh, nuance here, is that uh, political actors have an incentive to issue uh, deficits and then incur public debt because uh, they, want to have uh, power and have uh, power over time. Uh, so for them to, to do this, they're able to engage and enter into exchanges with different uh, interest groups uh, to be able to uh, do this. But they don't know ex ante uh, with whom to enter into exchanges. So in order for them to do this, they have to have some kind of uh, least costly uh, discovery process to be able to understand uh, with whom to enter into exchanges. And uh, rent creation is uh, this uh, type of form. So public debt and deficit spending is how uh, that is able to be uh, done. Um, uh, really quickly before I finish this slide, I do wanna show you a, a graphical illustration of all of this uh, because this is obviously in the paper, but also something that I think really uh, shows um, like a lot of, of what I'm trying to say. And some people do better with seeing uh, graphs here. Uh, so I use a, a, a simple price uh, searcher uh, model. 
So this is for a uh, political actor. And I have uh, the expenditures on the vertical axis and then the revenues on the horizontal axis. Um, and uh, as you can see here, where the uh, demand curve is equal to the uh, marginal uh, cost, that's where I have numbers in the uh, paper, but this is where uh, we would have the uh, budget in uh, balance. Um, but because a uh, political actor is a, a residual claimant over the uh, budget, uh, he or she can obviously have uh, a monopoly uh, type of of way of, of being able to um, to price a bit uh, higher. So this is where uh, just going on the marginal revenue curve, we can go up to a different price, and that's how much they actually will uh, spend. Um, John, we have uh, two raised hands already. Okay. Would you mind answering? So Pete. Yeah, uh, I don't mind. Pete and the yeah. yeah, Pete, jump in. Um, I didn't want to interrupt John's talk. I just wanted to be the first oh, you're on fine. this. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so I have three comments, John, and, and yeah. I like the paper and what you're trying to do. Obviously, we've talked about this, but yep. um, and the first one is going to belabor a point maybe that is irrelevant because you already said you're going to change the title. Yeah. But I actually think it matters a lot for your framing of the way you do arguments. Okay. As you were okay. saying you know you have a tendency to be discursive yes and a little and a little elliptical as opposed yeah. to a little bit more straightforward yes so i want to suggest first and foremost that whenever you use something in the title mm -hmm. you need to make sure that you define it and that you leverage it in the paper okay and so the problem isn't that the term harvey road and it's presuppositions is their view or presumptions, not pre not propositions. That's a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah, and, that was some purpose. Yeah, right. But it's not that it's ideologically charged. If someone said that to you, you know, discount that advice completely. Okay. I think um, okay. it's uh, because they're the ones who are being ideological. Because what Wagner and Buchanan are talking about is a fact. It's mm -hmm. a fact about the world that the people that are in Harvey Road had certain presuppositions. Yeah. And those presuppositions uh, uh, affected the way that they thought they could then implement Keynesian policies. Mm -hmm. But in the current draft, you don't spend any time talking about what those presuppositions are or anything yep. like that. So right. therefore, it's just verbiage that doesn't have an explanation to it. So you got to get rid of it. Okay. Um, and instead, I would go with the subtitle. Yeah, that's the, where I'm leaning towards right yeah, now. But yeah, but the problem there is that the term post Keynesian means something different than what you mean. True. Okay, yeah, I so I mean. would drop yeah. that and cut that yeah. word out. And so instead, what you just have is is basically, you know, your, your analysis of what you're trying mm -hmm. to do, which ultimately yeah. is about the fiscal commons. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, the second point is um, that you need to be clear about why it is that Keynesian economic policies create the fiscal commons. Mm -hmm. So the issue with the fiscal commons, and Dick Wagner has forgotten more about public finance than I'll ever learn, so he can straighten you out <laughs> better than I can. But to me, the, the, the fiscal commons emerges because you've split the revenue decision and the expenditure decision. Yeah, the, yeah that's a okay? beginning point. And so point, the key yeah. issue is why is that a consequence of the economic steering wheel or functional finance? Mm -hmm. Use the budget to balance the economy. Don't worry about yeah. balancing the budget. The yeah. issue is, is that that divorces the expenditure decision from the from the revenue decision and as a result unleashes the fiscal commons right which is then going to be overgrazed mm -hmm. <laughs> right that's that's what you're it invites the overgrazing that's the mechanism which you're yeah. trying to explain and you lay out okay yeah the third thing is and then this is just a um an issue having to do with whether or not you want to frame it in this regard or not 
because there's lots of various literatures that you can draw on to make your point. Yeah, one of of them is in the wake of the global financial crisis, Mm -hmm. Luigi Zangales resurrected the Buchanan Wagner argument Mm -hmm. in a debate with DeLong over the legacy of Keynes. Okay. Okay. That's the Luigi Zangales of 2009, 2010. He might be a totally different person today, but his argument at that time was that what Keynesianism did was it catered to the preferences of politicians, which was to reward their interest groups, right? And disperse, you know, concentrate benefits, disperse costs, logic kind of idea. Yeah. And what I think is interesting in that debate between Zengales and DeLong is that it basically mimics the debate that took place in the Times of London between Hayek and his group, which included Robbins and everyone else, mm-hmm. and Keynes and his group, which was an exchange of letters that went back and forth in the 1930s in the Times of London with a similar kind of position. Mm-hmm. And I would think that either a small like paragraph talking about that or at least a footnote pointing to that would yeah. show the contemporary relevance in the intellectual level as well as in the empirical level. So, you know, at one level, you know, you don't have a theory in search of data. You have data in search of an explanation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the reality is, is that the 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 most staring thing in our face is this idea of permanent deficit finance. Yeah. Okay. And and the proposition that government grows because it fails and it fails because it grows. Right. And that that has been the the sort of equilibrium for 75 years rather than just. And so, again, you know, you can sort of you're already tracking that at some level. Um, And 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 so the question is making sense of that proposition. So rather than the idea that it's the economic steering wheel that you're on deficits in in times of recession, surpluses in times of plenty and balance the budget over the life cycle of economic volatility, well, that's out the door Mm -hmm. precisely because this mechanism that opened that up led to all of this, right? And so I think that that using the Zangales and DeLong debate and the earlier debate actually, you know, could be leveraged in an interesting way. Maybe it's a separate paper. Um, I don't know. But those are the the three things that came to mind. And, and, uh, you know, as reading your paper, which I thought was much improved over earlier drafts so, <laughs> yes yeah. yes and and thank you I, like i want to just give a shout out but also thank you too for your uh help in the earlier drafts because that earlier draft was awful and thank you for helping me with with getting it here so i really appreciate that um but just a quick comment and like we can talk about this later pete um i think that the uh two uh later comments kind of relate to the paper that we're going to be working on together uh, so I think like trying to do like a whole, a reception study of Buchanan, uh, 1958 and Buchanan and Wagner, uh, 77, I think those, uh, two points about the revenue and expenditure, uh, sides being, uh, split and, and also the, uh, debate between, uh, uh, Zingales and, uh, and DeLong, I think those are more like relevant for our paper, but. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, and we can talk about let that. Me just, let me time. just push you just a little bit, and yeah. then I'll be quiet because other people need to jump in here. But sure. I think you don't have a mechanism unless you have wrestling with the fiscal commons. Okay. Right. It, 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 so it's not a question. So I agree with you about the issue having to do with Robbins and all of that stuff and Hayek and, and Keynes. Okay, you can leave that for someplace else. But yeah. you need to have the fiscal commons to be able to unleash the mechanism that generates the permanent deficit financing. This is why, you know, Dick uses the phrase wrestling with the fiscal commons. Okay. Right. And, and part of your story is that very innocuous changes in legislature Mm -hmm. led to seismic shifts in divorcing expenditure from 
uh, you know, uh, uh, spending expenditures from revenues. And as a result, because of that, there was this giant rent race that was unleashed, right? A giant yeah. big pile of money that said, come and get it and get it now. Yeah. All right. And that's what unleashed the sort of rent seeking state. Yeah. And so they, they reinforce each other in mm -hmm. a way that I think is your underlying mechanism. But again, okay. as I said, Professor Wagner knows, has forgotten more about this stuff than I know. So you should rely on him. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. That was very helpful. Okay, I uh, sort of uh, jumped the gun by allowing for questions uh, now. Uh, so uh, unless it's a short comment, maybe we will wait for John to, to finish. Uh, Aris, is that okay with you? Yes. Or Okay. All right. So yes, let's, uh, this is a short presentation. So let's let uh, John finish and then we will have a, a discussion uh, right after. So go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to just uh, go back really uh, quickly to this uh, slide uh, right here. I think one thing that I have to really uh, tighten up in this uh, paper uh, draft, and some of you might have noticed this, um, as of now, like what I'm trying to do and kind of building off of the uh, subtitle of the current title, but uh, more so what's going to be the future title, the rent creation and rent extracting state uh, in the fiscal commons. Um, as of right now, I really have uh, more of, um, I talk a lot about 